Hello, everyone. Welcome to this press conference for the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Would you please welcome with me now that celestial hybrid empath mantis, Palm Clementiev. <laughs> Groot himself, Vin Diesel. <laughs> Writer and director, James Gunn. <laughs> Peter Quill, alias Star-Lord, Chris Pratt. Martial arts master Gamora Zoe Saldana and the incredible Nebula Karen Gillan. Hey guys, you're allowed to sit. Welcome, have a seat. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. We're so happy to have you with us here in Paris. Thank you so much for being here with us. I'm going to start with a few questions and then we'll open it up to all the journalists in the house. Just to start, how did the premiere of the European gala screening go yesterday? What was it like? Chris? It was incredible. Yeah, we were, uh, we were in you know, Disneyland Paris at the Avengers campus. It was thousands of people, rabid fans, very excited, and it was a fantastic moment. It was really cool. I thought it was beautiful. We were sitting up on this, well, you saw the picture, this big, gorgeous spaceship with all these uh, fireworks. It was a, a surreal moment. Mm -hmm. And James, I mean, we were talking about this yesterday at the premiere. It is a bittersweet moment, of course, for you and for all of you. But if you were to sum it up, how would you best sum up the trilogy and, and your experience driving the trilogy from the beginning? Uh, I would sum it up as all-encompassing over the past 11 years of my life. I think I've probably spent 60% of my time thinking about the Guardians of the Galaxy. So this has taken up my entire life. So there is a weird situation where I just have to adjust everything about my world to be about something other than mm. the Guardians, um, which is which is difficult. But it's also, frankly, it's just a big relief also to uh, to feel like we finished this trilogy and we finished it in a way that we're really proud of and that we're all the characters I think get the dignity they deserve and so I'm really excited about that aspect of it. Mm. Zoe, tell us about Gamora. How fun was it for you this time around to kind of be in badass mode? Oh, oh I, I think that Gamora is always in badass mode but this time around um, it's a different Gamora. We all know the destiny she had in the last um, uh, Avengers movie and um, and she's from another multiverse and um, she's rough around the edges she's a little wilder she's let loose a little bit more in my opinion it was fun it was fun getting into into her into this Gamora mm. Karen how about for you how is Nebula different or how has she changed in this one Nebula's pretty different this time around I think we're sort of seeing a slightly lighter side to her personality a little bit, a little bit more humor I think. Is she funny? <laughs> um, and yeah, a little bit more like willing to show vulnerability, which has been quite difficult for her with her upbringing with Thanos. Mm. And so it's nice to kind of evolve the character into somebody who is willing to accept love for the first time and willing to show love to people for the first time in her life. Mm. Palm, we've really seen Mantis grow and evolve, becoming such a beloved character with a really fun storyline. Some people say that she's kind of the glue that holds the Guardians family together. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, I think it's true, but also, you know, Mantis um, uh, has been through a lot before uh, meeting the Guardians, and she felt pretty lonely, and the, the Guardians of, of the Galaxy are the family that she was craving for, um, so it's beautiful to see that, and then she found a brother, too, which is uh, mm -hmm. Peter Quill, <laughs> and um, yeah, and it was, like, really, really fun to get to play with uh, more emotions and to get to kick ass as well, <laughs> and to get to uh, to show um, a side of Mantis that is more fiery and more mad sometimes, and um, yeah, thank you, James. Aww. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Vin. Groot is really incredible. Groot has probably become one of the most, if not the most famous character with the most iconic line. We've seen baby Groot, teen angsty Groot. Who's Groot this time around in volume three? It's a good question. <laughs> well, first of all. Mike, Mike, Mike. Oh my God. <laughs> it's early. All right, so first of all, you know, not to change the subject, but obviously we all went through the pandemic. And I want you all here to know how much we really appreciate that you guys have come up and are entertained by us and care about us enough to come from wherever you're coming from and celebrate this final film in this trilogy. So an applause to all of you. Je suis content, je suis content. 
<laughs> Groot is such a special character. I'm so lucky and so grateful that that James Gunn created this archetype, this character. Um, he's fascinating in the sense that every single film he's different. Sometimes he's baby Groot, sometimes he's alpha Groot. And, um, but what makes Groot work so well is not only James Gunn, but the entire cast that's up here. They're the ones that bring Groot to life. They're the ones that Groot reacts to. He's able to have three monosyllabic words that mean something to you because of all of their incredible performance. So I'm just incredibly grateful and I love the character very, very, very much. I, I will always cherish the character and I feel very grateful <laughs> that, uh, that I have James Gunn and I have this incredible cast here that has brought Groot to life. Thanks for that, Vin. All right, I'm going to open it up to you all. Who would like to start? Do you have a first question? Uh, Isol, je, voilà, OK. Je vois juste ici devant. Hi, my Hi. name is Mohamed. I'm uh, editor-in-chief for Comic Systems and Crunchyroll News. So first of all, thanks a lot. That has been a great journey. Uh, there's one message I would like to say first. I'm Groot. <laughs> That's going to say, I uh, love you guys. He just said bad stuff about you. <laughs> no. I, I understand the language, and he's saying really nasty stuff oh. about you. About me specifically? About you specifically. Wow. No, he actually said all of us are pretty cool, but Chris Pratt's a dork. You really? <laughs> Muhammad, that was, That's I what mean, he said. <laughs> okay. I, <I'll... laughs> Like, <laughs> so rude. He agreed with you. He's like, yeah, he's like well, <laughs> gotta say it, man. <laughs> this is a nightmare. I, I love you guys. All love right, go guys. ahead, go ahead. What's your so, question? Good, big question. So, this movie is a big turnaround, and maybe this is probably one of the best promos in the Marvel Cinematic Universe lately. Uh, how did you handle this? Like, just trying to not show everything, but just give everyone enough to just get us through this emotional ride. Uh, and that question goes to everyone, but also to you, because the, like your the, movie. The, how, the pro, you know, like the promotional the promo marketing material? Yeah. Oh, well, it's hard, you know. <laughs> I mean, in this Thank day and age, like, let, let's, you know, Chris, <laughs> Chris and I talk all the time. We're like, oh, they're putting this scene online now? Do we really want that? Is that too much? <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess it gets more people to go to the theater, so... It's a balance, but you know, in some ways, I wish there was nothing ever out about anything. It's just go see this movie and then have everybody totally surprised. Um, so it is difficult finding the balance with the marketing team in terms of how much we give away and how much we don't. Uh, and uh, and hopefully we've you know striked a balance. I also think that people have learned over the years online how to consume promotional material for themselves and people are different. Some people want to see as much as possible and so right. they seek it out and they watch it. And some people don't want to see so much and they take in less. I know like on my you know social network feeds, I don't post everything. I don't post the scenes because a lot of people don't like to watch the scenes before they see the movie. I post, you know, the trailers, the few things that we have that are don't give too much away. Um, so I think that people now can kind of control that media for themselves, which is a good thing. What about on a deeper level when it comes to the script or to actual shooting or your interactions? How did you balance between the funny and the emotion? Because I find that that's really great in the movie. Was that something you all talked about? I don't know. Paul? I mean, it's James. It's James who writes the script and who's, um, you know, he's an incredible uh, conductor of orchestra. You know, he knows exactly when... Um, when to uh, to hit you with the emotion and to be grounded in something very deeply emotional and beautiful, and <laughs> and then surprise you with something funny, but just the right amount, you know. Because I see a lot of movies that w are funny all the time and ironic all the time, and then it doesn't touch me anymore. So y you're able to find this balance, and it's very very special, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question. Yeah, right here. Maxim from uh, Jurectu, and so I have a, a question for, for you, James. Um, the uh, Guardian 3 is more brutal, even more violent than the other MCU movie. Uh, what does it mean exactly that you have a free will, full, full permission to, to do that, that movie? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, listen, I was talking to one of the guys in here earlier, one of the journalists. It's like I've pretty much been able to, you know, I'm in a very rarefied position in Hollywood where I'm able to make movies that are of a certain budget level, but that are also what is, you know, true for me as much as possible. And I don't have interference from people. Um, that doesn't mean I don't take a lot of feedback and see what works and what doesn't. And I think that this movie, it was important to really be raw with it. You know, the characters, I love these characters. I think they're beautiful. I think that Rocket's story is the heart of this trilogy for me. And so to be able to tell that story fully, it does have some more brutal elements to it um, because I don't want to shy away from that. But I'm also really careful not to show uh, everything. I think that a lot of the things that are brutal in the movie are actually things that are in, in your mind as opposed to what you see. Um, you know, it's the idea of things as opposed to what we actually see on screen. So. And there's also some incredible fight scenes. I mean, kind of taking brutality to another more, you know, logistical level. How do you all prepare for the fight scenes? Like, I know, for example, Zoe, you come from a dance background. Did that help? I, I feel like it's the only reason I've been able to, to do uh, participate in this genre uh, of, of action and films, um, because of my athletic background. It's just how did do, how does that happen? What what takes place? A lot of rehearsals, a lot of conversations with James in terms of what he wants your character to do, and and you lean in. You you work with the stunt department. They usually surround us with amazing trainers. And you have a blast, you know? I have a ton of videos that I can't wait to show with you guys after May 3rd or May 5th, um, because I finally started to document um, that process. As I'm getting older, my body definitely aches every time I do my stunts. And this time around, I really wanted to you know, share the process that takes place because it's fun, it's grueling, it's a lot of work, but the end result is so wonderful. Another question right here. Bonjour, France Télévision. Bravo pour le film. Uh, vous avez... Bonjour, ma question est pour Chris. Uh, le film parle beaucoup d'amitié. Quel type d'amitié vous avez noué entre vous et uh, quelle, est... quelle prochaine collaboration vous vous souhaitez au sein de l'univers Marvel Okay, so Chris, the question's for you. He says the movie obviously is a lot about friendship. Can you talk a bit about the friendship that's kind of been created amongst yourselves? And also, la deuxième question, c'était sur l'avenir, en fait. And how do you see your future, or Star Lord's future, going forward in this universe Well, yeah, the, um, the, the destination of this film, May 3rd, May 5th, whenever it opens, everyone planting your asses in a seat and just being swept away on this journey. That's the destination. That's where we're headed. That's where we, we, day one of, of his pre-production, that's, that's the destination. The journey getting there is something that is really private and personal And I know that we, we're all willing to share uh, certain elements of it, but to us, at least to me, that to me is the, is the real magic of being able to do this job. I mean, I love the fact that the movie gets to come out and that the world is going to be seeing it. And the journey of getting there, on a lot of films, it's not great. On a lot of films, you, you have assholes you have to deal with, you have a bunch of problems, people are fighting behind the scenes and you would never know that. It's not the case with this film. The relationships between each of the people has been, to me, the most, <clears throat> the most enjoyable aspect of playing this character. The bonds that I have with James Gunn, uh, just doing bits nonstop, you know, constantly making uh, ourselves laugh and being on, even if no, literally no one else is in the room. Like, it's a nonstop thing. Getting to know each of these people, seeing their children being born, attending their weddings, yeah. uh, being a part of their lives in a real way, that's an extraordinary thing that, what I get, that we get to do. And um, uh, uh, kind of rare, I think, because there's not a lot of jobs that put you into the pressure cooker situation to create strong relationships between people. It's a crucible in which you're going to forge very tight bonds with people. Um, And then that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is Star-Lord, his future? Gosh, I don't know. I, uh, I don't know. I don't know I, at this point. I think I'm, you know, uh, open to doing more. I, don't, I want to preserve uh, mystery around the fate of the character through the course of the movie. I think the best way to watch this movie is knowing very little about the future of the characters because the stakes are very high and obviously uh, lives are at stake. I don't want to lead the, the audience away from anything other than this movie right now. 
thank you. Another question? Who's got the mic? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, Sabine from Moldoville. My question is about Rocket, you know, your favorite. I was deeply moved by his story. I would like to know the relationship you have, you know, with the animals, with the suffering, or the experimentation, because this is real, you know, the experimentation we are doing against the animal today. And also, how do you work with Shan? You know, because yeah. it's really well done. It's very powerful emotionally. And also for you, how do you work with Rocket and with Shen? Great. Um, yeah, I do think that really this, you know, this story is about empathy at the end of the day. And it's empathy for all living creatures and being as kind as we possibly can um, to all the people in our lives and all the creatures in our lives. That doesn't mean, you know, that's not a political thing. It's simply, a, you know, whatever your choices are with your relationship to animals, to be aware that they do have uh, feelings and um, can experience pain. Um, and so that's where we start this movie with this little animal that's incredibly uh, innocent and go through the journey of that character becoming the character we know, which is a bitter little mean raccoon, um, who then throughout the process of this movie, we see him a bit opening up to a wider sense of compassion and what that might mean. Um, and so that to me is the heart of the three Guardians movies. It's about, they're about compassion. Um, they're about uh, opening ourselves up. They're about the way we close ourselves off, maybe due to selfishness, maybe due to our own experiences in life that haven't been so great, whether they're traumatic or just negative experiences, and how we use those as either an excuse or just something deeply embedded in us not to open up to our fellow human beings. And this is a movie about this group of outcasts up here um, who they play outcasts in the movie and some of us are outcasts most of us up here are outcasts except for chris who's had a charmed life and really easy life um, <laughs> you know so uh but yeah so that's really what this is that's what this 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 series of films is about and um it was really important to me the reason why i chose to do this movie and to come back and do this movie is because i felt like a, a deep deep need to finish rocket's story and that's, that's what brought me to do it. I work with my brother, Sean. He is the hero of our lives when we're making this movie. He brings so much to Rocket. A lot of his emotions are, are uh, you know, based on Sean's acting in this movie. He actually is the voice of young Rocket, so he has a much bigger piece. Um, that's not to take anything away from Bradley Cooper, who is one of my favorite people and an incredible actor and brings so much emotion through his voice. And in this movie in particular, he and I worked incredibly hard going through the scenes again and again and again. Like, you know, if we have one of these guys do a scene on set, I make him do it a bunch of times and it gets, you know, hard and I push him and I push him and I push him and it gets better and better. But with me and Bradley, we have until the end also with Vin, you know, we have no limit to how many times we can do something. And Bradley, you know, I give him the movie. He takes it home. He sends me new kinds of ways to do things, and we just keep doing it again and again. Um, so, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's that. But Sean is, I think these guys all, you know, this is, you know, we had the last scene with the Guardians in the, ha in the hallway where we shot with all of these guys for the last time along with Dave and Sean. And that's, you know, those are the guardians on set. And that day was incredibly emotional because there is a bond between all of us. Right. I mean, I can only imagine after all these years together, 10 years, uh, Karen, do you, is there anything that surprised you the most about this experience over the past decade of being a guardian? Oh, surprised me. Yeah, or something I that mean, you didn't think was going to be if you had known where you were 10 years ago that you would be feeling this today? I mean, I didn't actually know I wasn't sure that I was going to become a fully fledged guardian, actually. Like James had told me that this character was going to evolve in all these amazing ways, but like I didn't realize I was going to be a guardian. And then we were filming, you know, this movie and I got to wear the uniform. We did like the obligatory slow motion walking shot to cool music. And I felt cool and I felt like a guardian. And I was like, oh my God, I've graduated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's got the mic now, please? Well, as you see. Uh, hi, I'm Danny from Switzerland, and I would like to know uh, what is first 
uh, James, is it the music and the song or is it the scene? And uh, does the guys left and right have any influence on the selection of the songs? Why, because uh, they're of that generation? <laughs> uh, on the second thing, no. Um, yeah. On the first thing, uh, uh, it, it really is, it comes together. You know, I mean, I keep a list of music that'll work for the movie um, and try to come up with a feel. This movie was by far the most difficult to put the music together for, and I changed it and changed it and changed it throughout the process. When they got the first script, it was some different music in it than what we ended up with, not in the last script. Um, but it's while I'm writing, I simply listen to a bunch of different music while I'm writing and then try to fit that together in the scene. So it's very concurrent, the writing of the script and the picking of the music. Uh, just a, a quick question for you, Vin, before we move on to the next question. We've got journalists here from all across Europe. I saw that you actually did the dubbing of your lines in many different languages. Do you remember a couple you can do for them? <laughs> wow. <laughs> if you don't, Besides, it's okay. uh, je suis Groot. Yeah, no, no, it, it's je suis Je s'appelle Groot. C'est ça? Je s'appelle Groot. Je no. Je s'appelle Groot. Je s'appelle Groot. Yeah. Nice. Good. All right, we got okay. friends. <laughs> That's a good start. Anyone else? Yo, yo sono Groot. Yo sono Groot. Si. Ich, ich bin Groot. Ich, ich bin Groot. No, no. Ich bin Groot. <laughs> Give me some other ones. Yo si Anything you want to add, James? I don't know. Anyone <laughs> else? Spanish, what is it? <laughs> Sorry. Wait, wait. I am Groot. <laughs> I am Groot. I like that. <laughs> I think I, I think I got it, right? right. That's, that's a very impressive. Thank okay. you. Another question. Who's, who's got the mic? Yeah. Hi, uh, Tommaso from El País, Spain. To question one for James. Um, you've been doing some, like, let's call it different superhero movies. Also, you've been defending superhero movies by some even famous directors who said that, I mean, they're becoming a little bit boring, more of the same, too many, etc., etc. Is it frustrating to have to do that on one side and on the other? Do you see their point in some of the critics? And for the rest oh, of... Oh, I, I agree with that point. I've never argued against that. I think that there are many superhero movies that are becoming boring, so I would never argue that. Well, the thing that I, I, I take, you know, some offense to um, is saying that there's, you know, cinema has a tradition of different genres, and, you know, there are amazing Westerns, there are amazing gangster films, and there are amazing films that are based on comic books. And I, I am not a, you know, I believe that all of those things can be real and all of those things can be cinema. And saying that one type of film, because of the subject matter or because of the characters, aren't cinema is, is ludicrous. The second question for the rest of the, well, for all, all the rest. Uh, you've been working with James for like many years, three movies. Uh, you've been supporting him in the most difficult moment. What about him? Like what's special, what's different about him as a person and also as a director? Thanks. Chris? Me? What's, what's great about me? You were looking what's, reflective. What's great about me? That's <laughs> the oh, question. What, what do you um, love most about Don't me? worry, this will be quick. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, James, gosh, I can compare him to the other directors that I've worked with. I've worked with a lot of great directors, but there's something about James, what sets him apart, his preparation. He's always very prepared. He, he is, works tirelessly. He doesn't shut his mind off. He's a, he, for these films in particular, he's a, a, a student of the comic book genre, uh, films and, and, and the canon of, of comic books that have existed in, in Marvel and in DC and in outside of that as well. I stayed at his house while I was m working on a film recently and he's got a library of comic books that all of the indexes are well-worn. He reads this stuff. He lives and breathes this stuff, so he's the right guy for this. He's been making movies forever. He, he, he had a great start making movies for no money, which really you have to learn how to really stretch a dollar. And when you're talking about having... 150 or 200 million of those dollars, he can really make them stretch to give you the very best uh, return on the investment. He knows uh, action very well. He knows how to talk to people. He's incredibly articulate. He kn has, a, has a very clear vision and 
will tell you if he if something's not working. He knows how to uh, direct various people based on their personalities. What might work for one person won't work well for another. He's got a wealth of experience and knowledge. He's an incredibly empathetic person. He cares deeply about people. He cares a lot about animals, and he's really fucking weird. And so that's like helpful because he's a misfit himself. So when he's creating a story about misfits, he knows the heart of a misfit. He wants to tell the story in the heart of a misfit. Him and his brother Sean. He's been torturing his brother Sean on screen since they were t kids and you look at the dedication that Sean has to playing Rocket this is a this is an incredibly un uh uh, unsung hero of our show. He gets very little credit. His face isn't on the work. His voice isn't in the work. And yet every single fucking day he shows up, he puts real passion in it. When he's crying tears, they're real tears. He's down on his hands and knees playing this character in a way that they would do for free. They happen to do it for a lot of money because they're worth it, but they would literally do it for no money because it's what they've been meant to do. That's amazing. Thank you. Well said. Psych. <laughs> he is a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's got the mic, please? Right over here. Bonjour. You ruined it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you ruined it. Yeah. Bonjour, Julie, pour le journal du geek. Donc, ma question, c'est, ça fait six ans qu'on n'a pas vu les gardiens de la galaxie dans un film solo. Est-ce que ce temps a été bénéfique au développement et en quoi ça a changé le film? Okay, so it's been six years since we've seen the Guardians as an entity together. Has that time been beneficial when it comes to perhaps your character evolution or moving forward with the movie or your roles? I don't know, maybe Pam, you want to speak to that? Oh my God, how has it been different for me? I don't know, it's like about the, the script. Maybe it just gave more... Maybe your well, relationship... Your character changed yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah. Also, we shot the holiday special, which was so much fun to shoot. I got to be the weirdest I had ever been, which was so nice. Except I would for in real life. <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> no, I kept asking James, uh, am I doing too much? And he was like, no, 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 it's the holiday special. Go crazy. I'm like, okay. I'm gonna go crazy. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> we do that all the time on set. <laughs> there, there's something that happened in Endgame, Avengers Endgame and, and Infinity War where Gamora dies and then comes back a different version of herself and I think that was something that in that six year period um, allowed for a type of limitation where James had to use his imagination to try to, re like, try to figure out how that's going to have an impact on the relationship between Quill and Gamora and wow, I'm, I'm really grateful that that was the reality because we were able to explore a romantic relationship over the course of a trilogy that's really goes against the grain and subverts your typical romantic trope because of who she is, because she doesn't know who she is. It's a really powerful exploration into loss uh, between people who love one another when the other person that you've lost is standing right in front of you. I haven't seen that before in movies, and so I thought that made it a really original take on your uh, traditional romantic story. It was. It was really fresh. It was, it was, uh, it was interesting as well because... Trying to play into that love story of, I don't know who this man is. I have no shared experiences that I can, you know, I can, I can lean on. But yet he feels so familiar. So that playing that confusion uh, was an unconventional love story for sure. But it was a love story. They still yeah. had chemistry. Yeah, and you're such a... She an, still an, found you annoying. All these characters... <laughs> <laughs> all of these characters are so damaged. And so I was able to, or Quill was able to witness... Uh, how Gamora became a much better, more happy and fulfilled person through finding r the romantic love with Quill, but also the, you know, the love of, of her family with the Guardians of the Galaxy. So as a guy who desperately loves her, he wants so badly for her to just have that again. And this is a, a person now in this uh, installment, if you guys have all, all seen the film, obviously you know what happens, I don't want to spoil it, but he, he's desperate for her to find that love, not just because it would fill his heart again, but also because he knows what it meant for her. I think it's, you know, it's an interesting thing when you work with people for so many, you know, for so long, you know, in such long shoots, and then you become friends with them outside of that process. You get to know them on a molecular level. So it makes the movies naturally in some ways get more interesting because I know that Karen, how funny Karen is. And so Nebula all of a sudden has a humorous streak that she didn't have in the first movie. I know that Zoe has this, like... This way to be so focused on one thing and just be there. And so it makes she's, you know, much more of a of a tougher 
crazier, meaner character in this movie because I know what she's able to do and how cool she is, you know? And Pom is absolutely insane. And so <laughs> I can bring that to the character of Mantis. No, it's like, I knew that from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and Vin, you know, he's really good at saying I am Groot. <laughs> Okay. I'm getting better. <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's got the mic? Here we go, please. Uh, hello, my name is Antea from uh, Notre Cinema, and I have uh, two questions. So the first one is for Pom. Um, how do you see the future of the character because the path, the, the importance of the path she chose at the end? Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, it's very hard for me to imagine Mantis uh, without James Gunn. So I can't even imagine it because he's uh, he wrote the the arc of our characters, and he um, even we, when we were in the Avengers movies, he was like making sure that the storyline of the characters made sense, and also the words that came out of uh, of my mouth was were always written by James Gunn or like supervised by him, you know. So I I don't know, but if there is another special, maybe a sh Mantis Shroom special would make sense. <laughs> with a lot of little shrooms. So I don't know. But I don't think James Gunn would love to write that, so maybe not. Are you like, is this like a, a Mario thing that you're talking about? No, it's like kind of psychedelic and fun. Okay. I don't know. Do you guys have ideas? That. Mantis on shrooms, you heard it here first. Yeah. Okay. And you had another question? Uh, another question for Zoe. So uh, how did you manage to put yourself um, into the shoes of this new Gamera in terms of acting? Because it's the new Gamera, and so the fact that the fans need to know that this Gamera is no longer the Gamera they know. Is there any chains between the two? Um, I, I think I just didn't. I didn't want to get in her way. Obviously, I was I was missing the old Gamora. We were creatures of habit. We like what we're used to. Um, but in order for me to be this new character, I, I really needed to not get in her way. And I needed to understand that her path is her own. And um, so that kind of, it was hard. It was hard because, you know, but, but using also that bittersweetness, that knowing that this was the last time for Gamora and knowing that this is possibly the last time for the Guardians and just allowing that melancholy to be, to be there um, was, was fun, was fresh. And also she's crazy. There's a, there's a crazy side to Gamora that I, I just felt like, oh, you're definitely somebody that I may want to hang out with now. <laughs> <laughs> So after all this time, as you guys w walked off the set, what, w did you take anything? Do you have a little souvenir that you're going to keep for the rest of your lives from the set that you're allowed to talk about? I took a pinwheel. The pinwheel? Oh, did you take the pinwheel? Yeah. I don't know how you say in French pinwheel, by the way. Oh, it was really? cute. And also a little ukulele, but it's not in the movie anymore. So what's... <laughs> yeah. Know. Anyway. Anybody else? Anything for I have, like, it, there's a scene in the the, uh, the Bat family's home where we have all their, their photographs and all their weird little sculptures and paintings on the wall of the what we call the human animals. I got everything from that house. It's all, yeah, it's all up in my house, in my uh, house and house. Wait, all the pictures? Wow. Yeah, the, the, pic, the paintings. I have that so good. pug dog, and I have all those little sculptures with yeah. those little weird things <laughs> up so in my funny. house. Yeah. What about the rest of you? Karen? Oh, um... This isn't exactly answering that, but we shot that Humanimals scene right after my bachelorette party, <laughs> which was, so me and, and, and Pom was one of my bridesmaids. Oh my so God. we were there like, are you saying this? <laughs> it was a wild experience. Yeah, we're, anyway. <laughs> we're like, are we hallucinating? Yeah, is it like, real life? That, what right? is this? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, did I take anything? I accidentally took a pair of socks by accident. Um, I still have them and I still wear them, but they're not really like nebula. They're like underneath the costume. So that's <laughs> not interesting at all. <laughs> Sorry. I take socks all the time in underwear. <laughs> you take underwear? Yeah, just steal it. <laughs> Why would I give it back? It's weird to give it back anyway, no? Oh, yeah, I guess they're not going to use it again, hopefully. <laughs> or could, maybe they could, but that would be weird too. Yeah. <laughs> Zoe, what did you take? No, I, I, um, everything is just so top secret that the, the, the thought of taking something and being called out by Marvel uh. just was <laughs> petrifying. Um, but I've kept every sweatshirt that I get, every t-shirt that I get from every department that has been kind enough to extend that gift to me and my dad and my father-in-law wear all of them 
all the time because I I'm always given to, they're always like in large or you know sizes that are not mine and uh, and I but we've kept we've kept you know just souvenirs like the hats and the posters every time we're we're um, doing press tours I've I've tried to ask to have you know a poster that's signed by all the cast so that one day when my kids find me cool again um, they can have it and they you know they won't like sell it for charity and like buy themselves I don't know a pair of sneakers and stuff I don't know and Vin how about you I mean I know you weren't actually on the set but do you have anything from um well I'm lucky that um and this goes back to a question you asked earlier about James Gunn he is so thorough and everybody talks about it but he's so thorough that um and over prepared in a good way that he comes to our sessions with a script that has the intention of every single I am group. And so uh, starting 10 years ago, so I've always felt really privileged that I'm the only human on the planet <laughs> that gets this script. And so I cherish all of them very much. That's great. And we're almost out of time, but Chris, just to wrap up, what about you? Oh, yeah, I always steal a bunch of shit from set. Uh, I got all kinds of stuff. My yeah. wallet. Yeah, I got your wallet. Uh, I took, uh, I got, um, man, I got, a, I got a lot of really great stuff. Uh, I, took, I took some stuff out of Quill's apartment. Uh, I took some stuff from nowhere, some like salt shakers and some like uh, some uh, stuff that was from the restaurant scene. I took a bunch of that stuff, and I never ask. I just take it. It's great. Um, I have my wardrobe. I take that. Usually, costume departments loses like one or two of their costumes every time. <laughs> and um, uh, I got my gloves, and uh, um, I got my boots. And um, oh my god, you've taken a lot of stuff. <laughs> what the hell? I know, but it should also be pointed out that like Chris stole like the first Star Lord uniform, but then he was wearing it to hospitals with kids one day oh, they're you know. gonna be like sir oh that's sir, what you were doing it's not relevant anymore you're gonna have print to that print <laughs> that that's important <laughs> yeah yeah Aww. and all yeah well well listen thank you so much to all of you it's been such a pleasure to have you with us here in paris we're so sorry we're all out of time but let's give them a big round of applause thank you thank you, thank thank you guys so thank much. you so much really thank you